What's up, guys? This is Heiss, and welcome to another 101 class about railroad topics. Today's class is Signals 101. That's right, we're going to be talking about railroad signals and 10 different levels of understanding that are associated with them. So I am actually a signal design engineer by trade right now, which means I deal with the designs of these systems for both light rail and for commuter rail trains in the United States. And so that's where my perspective is going to be coming from. So level zero is looking at these two pictures and seeing, okay, I've got a traffic light that I see every day on the left, greens on bottom, yellow in the middle, and red on top. And on the right, I see a train signal and the red's on bottom, which is kind of weird, but it's still red, yellow, and green. So green means go, red means stop, right? Well, kind of. And that's where the rest of the levels come into play. Our first level is going to take a look at the background at why the green is on top for the train signals and a little bit of history of signals. And of course, it's always a little complicated. Enter level one, the progression of actual signal devices. So there's a couple important terms for us to know when we talk about these. A signal is capable of displaying an aspect, and an aspect is designed to convey an indication to the engineer. The physical thing that you're seeing being a ball in a raised position, an arm in a raised position, or a green light on top, what this indicates to the engineer might be as simple as go or stop. It may also be a lot more confusing than that. But let's start with the early mechanical signals. What we have over here on the left are called ball signals. In the middle, we have what is called a semaphore, and this is a more modern semaphore that also includes a color light aspect as well. And then on the right, we have a modern day completely color light signal. So in the early days, before we had any signals, trains just operated based on track warrants where they got told by someone at the office that said, hey, this train can occupy this chunk of track for this amount of time. It needs to be in the siding by this time to clear another train of a higher priority and you'll meet. And if you get to the meeting point and the train's not there, well, then we'll have to figure it out. And if you have a problem in route, you have to send flagmen out ahead of the train or behind the train to protect the train in event of an issue. And obviously, as we scaled up and got more and more trains, this became kind of unfeasible and a lot more complex operations. So we decided to come up with some ways of telling the engineers what's going on with the tracks. So the first signals actually ended up becoming mechanical versions of the hand signals that train crew give to the engineer. So your brakeman or your conductor will give a high sign to go ahead and they will cut the tracks in half down low, more or less to say stop. And so the early mechanical signals were emulating that. And so some early designs were ball signals or semaphore signals. Ball signals were not nearly as prevalent as the semaphore signals ended up being, but I include them for the sole reason that the ball in the upper position is a term that is used in railroading in the States to this day, and that is the high ball. This is where it comes from. High ball means, yes, proceed at track speed. Go. Go ahead. Do the thing. And you'll hear us to this day say, we got the high ball. Let's go. Quite frequently, that sort of thing, uh, despite these signals not have really been in use for a long time. All right, high ball. High ball. <laughs> Whereas some semaphores are actually still in service on main lines in the United States, though they are dwindling. So in the case of a ball signal, low means no, high means yes, you can go. With semaphores, you either had the semaphore parallel to the ground, somewhere in between for yellow or approach, or all the way up as displayed here to say yes, proceed at track speed. And you can see that as the semaphore rotates, there's a bulb behind it that shines through these glass roundels that then end up giving the lit aspect to the engineer as well in green, yellow, and red. This is a later semaphore. Early ones were just the arms, but as color light signals started to become a thing, they ended up adding these as well in many locations. And to keep with that tradition, when we did get to color lights, many railroads kept it the same way where the green is on top, because green is go, and it's high. Then we have yellow, 
and then we have the red on bottom, which is why our signals don't 100% match up with the traffic signals that you see on the roads today. But what do these different lights mean? And what does it mean when there's more than one head and all sorts of different things? Well, that's getting into level two, which is actually talking about the physical aspects themselves and what they mean. And I want to say that you could spend an entire course right here and talk about every different railroad and each railroad's different and they have different ways that they like to do it. So we're not gonna spend a lot of time at level two today. And the reason for that, throughout history, railroads had different signals, different types of rules, different ways to go. This is what BNSF Railway uses specifically, but not every railroad will follow this. And to me, the interesting part of signals is not necessarily what they tell the engineer, but how and why the signals get set the way that they are. In general, you have green, which means go, more or less. It means proceed, and in some cases it means proceed at a different speed, depending on its combinations. Yellow in various varieties will mean that you have to proceed at a slower speed, prepared to stop, and red ultimately means stop, as well as dark. A dark signal is treated as a red signal or a signal of the most restricting type. So if you come out and there's no power, you also have to stop because you know that the signals aren't working. But then there's many, many combinations that have come up with the modern day of railroading where you end up having multi-head signals where you have a yellow over green or flashing yellow or all these different kinds of indications throughout here. I recommend you look up these aspects to see what they indicate to an engineer if you're really interested and you really want to learn those pieces but I think you could do a whole course on this, and it's not as interesting, I think, as the more granular stuff behind the scenes. This is only important if you're going to get to run a train. But the point of it is that with the different combinations of greens and yellows, or yellows and reds, we can tell different things about what's going on up ahead. Whether we're approaching just to another signal that's at stop or at red, or we're coming up to a switch and we're going to change tracks at various different speeds. That's what most of these combinations of flashing aspects, or yellows over greens, or yellow over red, or red over yellow, all that stuff really means is you're coming up to a switch and it has a various different speed to change out. And there's of course more different types that are in there too for other cases but that's going to cover most of your bread and butter so i'll leave a link in the description if you really want to learn these aspects and what they indicate to an engineer so that was level two level three is talking about how we controlled signals in the early days in the early days of mechanical signals we had mechanical controls we wanted to have all the signals controlled from one area for all of the local signals we have what you call an interlocking tower right here, or as the British call it, a signal box. You can see that there is actually a run of what look like pipes underneath that run parallel to the track, and then they end up snubbing up to the underside of this interlocking tower. And these are actually the mechanical linkages and pulley system to actually operate these signals for this diamond crossover. If you have a train that's coming this way, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that nobody else is coming this way, otherwise you could have a very nasty accident. And so how do we control those? Well, we have all these levers up in the interlocking tower and we can set these levers to one position or another to make each one of those signals say what we want. And the reason it's called an interlocking tower is that a number of these levers are actually interlocked. And what that means is that if I have this red lever pulled out like this, well, then I can't pull this blue lever out. Imagine that the red lever controls the signals for this direction on this track. You don't want to be able to say any trains can come that way. And you also don't want to have any trains coming this way or this way. So when you pull that red lever and say, yes, this train can go, I'm giving a positive upwards mechanical indication. The lever to say trains can go this way, this way, or this way all get locked out. They are interlocked so that they can no longer be moved mechanically to ensure that there is no error made by the operator up here. Interlockings themselves get extremely complicated. This is an extremely simple one. This is about as simple as they come. And they get more and more complicated and more and more interesting and more and more advanced throughout history. So much so that interlockings themselves are going to be an entirely separate 101 class. We're not going to talk about interlockings in this video. We're going to try and focus on the signals. So look forward to that one when it comes out later. But in the early days, the point is we had our interlocking tower 
and we had some amount of controls at wayside stations as well. A lot of early stations had simple signals that could say, hey, you're good to go, or no, you need to stop and receive orders from the station. So if something came up, they would send a telegraph to the station master. Station master would learn that a train down the line suffered a failure and blocked the track or something, and okay, by timetable, this train was supposed to be able to run past the station and was planning to blow right through, but he gets up and within distance and can see that there is a, a signal saying, hey, stop and receive orders. And so you could stop the train, or on the fly, they would hoop up orders. They'd hand up orders with basically a, a strung hoop that the engineer or fireman would lean down and grab, and then that, that would be something that would usurp their timetable instructions. And so they would get an order that says, hey, you need to stop here now because this other train couldn't make it based on whatever actually came through the depot and over the telegraph. The point of level three is we have manual control at distinct locations like stations and interlocking towers. So what's level four then? Well, level four is taking that concept and bringing it to one place on a more global scale with centralized traffic control. And this is a really early version of centralized traffic control, or CTC for short. We end up having a diagram of the whole railroad or the whole section or subdivision of the railroad, and we can control all of the switches and all of the signals remotely from one location. This is where dispatch starts to become a thing. Trains can radio into me and request signals and request routes, and I can sit here and I can throw the switches and I can light up the signals and make it happen, and it all communicates back and forth between dispatch and the individual signal bungalows that actually make the things happen out in the field. And then we get the more modern variant, of course, which is actually just a computer version rather than a mechanical version, and the communication becomes even more simple. Rather than calling a physical relay from a remote location and making it do the thing, and then seeing the lights light up on this electromechanical board, we end up doing a simple click and say, okay, I have a train in this block. I want this train to go past this signal, and I want him to take this route. Okay, well, I click the entry signal, I click the exit signal, and then all of the switches and all of the signals figure out what they need to do and clear the route based on the logic set within the processors themselves, which we'll talk about a little bit more down the road. But the whole point is, in level four, we go from having many, many locations very local, very specific to the, the geometry of the railroad, and we're relying on human communication and humans to walk out of the interlocking towers to go throw the switches. And then we're taking that concept and bringing it to one central location where one person can handle the indication of the switch, throwing the switch from one place, and also clearing the signals or having it done all automatically through the computer. So we've been at this for a little bit here, so let's take a quick review of what we've talked about so far through level four. So we started off knowing that we know our roadway traffic signals, and we assume that the colors on the train signals do the same thing, and, and they kind of do, but we quickly learned that we needed different signals for trains, because rather than letting the trains rely on operating via a schedule that's set on paper, real things happen and things need to change on the fly, and so we need ways to talk to trains. So we came up with some early mechanical means to do that, that then graduated into more modern electrical ways to do that. We also learned that each signal has what is called an aspect, which is the combination of lights and or semaphore positions, and then each aspect has a name that indicates something different to the engineer and the train crew, and that, of course, every railroad had slight variances, though most modern day ones are relatively similar, given the same set of signal setup, because some signals are still set different. East Coast USA, I look at you. In level three, we learned that rather than having control over just one signal, we could have the control of many via interlocking towers and all of the levers within them, and that the levers were connected in such a way that we could only allow one signal to clear at a time. We couldn't allow conflicting routes to clear over the route that we've said, yes, the train can run over. And that is called an interlocking. We also learned at this level that many early signal communications were done 
over telegraph to depots and stations where the station master could then indicate to the train that they needed to receive orders or stop at the station. And that's the basis of most of early railroading signals. In level four, we then learned that we were able to take these concepts and apply them on a more global scale, both electromechanically and digitally through the computer. So what's level five? Well, so far we've been relying a lot on human interaction and human input. So how do we stop doing that? Well, in the early days, they did it mechanically. What happens when your engineer doesn't see the signal or the signal's broken and you need the train to stop and you have no way to operate it? Well, it sounds like you could have an accident on your hands because we have these signals that we want to follow now. And if they're not working for some reason, that's a problem. Well, an early way to do it was to have what they called automatic train stop, which is basically a very primitive mechanical way to stop the train. We have the signal located here. And the signal is tied to this device called a trip stop. And as the train passes over, there's a little valve sticking down that is connected to the brake pipe on the train. And if you need to learn what a brake pipe is, I suggest you go check out my Air Brakes 101 video, where you go over how train air brakes work. But as the train flies over, if the signal's at stop, saying red, don't go, this lever sticks up and it punches the valve open, which releases the brake pipe pressure which means that the train goes into an emergency application. So as soon as the train passes this and it's set to, you can't pass me, bang, the train's going to stop. And so this is one of the early ways that we can get an actual automated way to stop trains. And this was actually even in the steam era on a lot of the East Coast railroads. This concept also continued on and became an electromagnetic driven version where you had a strong electromagnet perform the same operation with a receiving coil on the car that de-energized an electronic valve. So rather than chancing on a valve handle being in exactly the right spot, the right length not broken off, no problems there, to then hit something and cause a lot of wear and tear and maintenance problems, you do it over the air via magnetism. And those systems are actually still in place in some places in the world. This still doesn't really automate the signal itself. We still have to tell the train that we want it to stop. What if there was a way that we could know that we need to tell the signal to stop? Well, there is, and that is level six, track circuits. Track circuits are the first way that we can actually detect the presence of a train. So how does it work? We have our track up here, it's made up of two rails and then a large amount of ties, of course. If you'd like to learn more about railroad track, we also have a 101 for that on the channel. But as a part of the track, there are joints between the rails. I've noted them here. And for signal purposes, these are special joints called insulated joints. And you can see that there is this dark compound between the rails that separates them. So that this rail and this rail are electrically isolated from this one and this one. So we have defined this as one piece of track. This is one track circuit, this region, from this insulated joint pair to this insulated joint pair. And now what we do is we essentially hook up basically a car battery to both rails. So we take our positive off this side and we hook it to this rail. We take our negative and we hook it up to this rail. So we have positive electricity flowing down this rail and it gets to the other end and we take another wire, tap it off, and then we run it through the driving portion of a relay. And we've drawn the simple relay right here. So when that positive electricity runs all the way through the rail, gets picked up by the receiving lead, it goes through and it picks up this relay. And that means that it is clear. There is nothing in this track circuit Okay, and then that energy then runs through back the negative rail and completes the circuit. A neat fact of trains is that they have metal wheels with metal axles. And so as soon as we get a wheel set that comes in here and bridges the gap, now we have a different situation. Now the positive electricity goes into the rail, it flies on down, and it likes the path of least resistance, so rather than flow through the rest of this madness, it actually just flows through the wheel set and then comes back. And so now, we have no positive energy going to this relay. And when we lose that positive energy, the relay drops. By gravity, it drops down and says, hey, this track circuit is now occupied. And you'll note that for safety reasons, it's really critical that 
the relay dropping makes the track circuit occupied because that means if we have no power if there's a problem with the battery if there's a problem with the rail if we have a rail break and the circuit breaks if the circuit breaks in any way it says this track is occupied you can't have a train come into this track because this is really the basis of how signal design works is that we learn where a train is and then we make sure that other trains can't get there we say okay well, there's a train following this train. Well, we're going to put a signal there and say that it's at red because there's a train in here. We don't want another train coming into the back of this train. That's a very simple explanation, and it gets a lot more complicated than that. And you can really set it up however you want, but there's good standard practices to follow there. So this is a simple electronic track circuit. For viewers out there who are in countries that have really good passenger railroads and a uh, lot smaller networks, they'll note that most of their railroads are electrified. And on an electric railroad, you have an overhead catenary, and you have your positive voltage for the train there, and your negative return goes through the rails. So you can't have DC power from a battery running through both rails as a circuit when you're using the tracks as a circuit to power your train. So how does that work? This is a really cool subject, and there's a couple different types. The first type is called an audio frequency track circuit. So in this case, instead of having a battery, we can have an audio signal generator. Imagine it's like a speaker almost. And we can couple that to the rail. And we can vibrate a signal through the rail. And then we get down to the receiving end and we have a microphone listening. And that microphone drives the relay. And the microphone wants to hear that frequency. The, the speaker sings one pitch all the way down the rail. It gets there. Cool. If it doesn't get there because it travels across a wheel and short circuits, then the relay drops out. And the reason that this is really cool is that this system doesn't need the insulated joints. You can actually have seamless track. You just place what are called bonds at the location that are tuned for the frequencies, you send out one audio frequency that way, and you have a tuned receiver that says, okay, well, I'm listening for this note over here, and then this guy down here is listening for a different note. So this guy's listening for an A, and this guy's listening for a B. And just like you can hear different notes in a melody, these tuned receivers can hear these different notes. And so as this note comes in, and disappears okay well i know there's a train in that track circuit and then it comes in there's no insulated joints it's just seamless rail as it passes that node all of a sudden you get that a back to the receiver and then the b is getting cut off as the train progresses this way and so we lose that so we can see the train progress without the use of insulated joints there's also a really cool way to do this a similar seamless detection with what's called a power frequency track circuit where we do a similar thing to the car battery style setup, but instead of using DC power, we use AC power. So in the United States, we use 60 Hertz as our main electrical frequency. And so to ensure that we don't have any noise and to ensure that there's no fighting with any vibration, we pick a different frequency. So let's say it's 100 Hertz, which is actually what a lot of Europe uses or multiple of, I think they might use 50, whatever. If we send a 100 Hertz signal down the rail and we know it's oscillating at 100 Hertz as it goes, and we know the length of our circuit, we can expect what phase that 100 hertz is going to be in when it gets back to our receiver. And as the wheel set rolls in, bang, and it starts to intercept it, it actually shifts the phase of that 100 hertz signal that we're sending. So a power frequency track circuit is also known as a phase shift or a phase shift overlay track circuit because we're overlaying it over another electrical signal. But because this one is distinct in a sine waveform and we can measure its change, we can know that a train has appeared and that then drives the relay. So that's a couple different kinds of track circuits. Track circuits are really cool and they're really, really important. They're really the foundation of most modern day train control. Okay, where are all those relays? Where are all those car batteries? Where do those things live? Well, Leighton Moreland, they live in the signal bungalow. I say Leighton because that was a very funny moment on one of our games of Jeopardy. So on the wayside of the railroad, you'll see these pre prefabricated metal structures. There's many different types. Some are actually built into station buildings and other things, but midway through the railroad, you'll see these, and these are signal bungalows. All of the relays, the track circuits, the car batteries, 
They're not actually car batteries, but you get the idea. All of the signal equipment lives in here. So your signal bungalow is really your level seven. And signal bungalows are equipped with a number of different things to protect the equipment and protect from trespassing. They're typically equipped with locks, trespassing alarm to make sure that no one can get in, and inside they're typically both heated and air conditioned so that the equipment works within its operating specification, and then the equipment inside is mostly included in dustproof housings so that everything can continue to work seamlessly so that we can maintain the fail-safe nature of things. Because ultimately, if anything fails in the name of train control, we don't want trains to crash. We don't want to have a train run into a train because of failure of our equipment. And so anytime we have a failure, it is designed to put everything to stop. But what's inside the signal bungalow? Well, lots and lots of fun things. Here's just a sample of some of the equipment that you'd see inside of the bungalow. And I want to take this opportunity in now level eight to talk about the principle of vitality in train control design and why these relays are in these sealed boxes. So the whole principle of train control and signal design is that everything has to fail to stop, as we said. So if we lose power, we have to say stop. If one of the lights goes out in our signals, we need to downgrade it to a lesser aspect, or we need to make it go dark and make the train stop. If we can't know that our switch is thrown, we can't let a signal clear through it. And we achieve all those things by utilizing a number of relays and later digital relays within a processor, but we'll get to that. And we need to make sure that these relays don't fail. And so they have to be considered vital. And there is a whole principle of vitality within train control design where the equipment is held to an extremely high standard. Hence why you're seeing relays that are in dust sealed enclosures that prevent any dust from inside the bungalow from getting in there. And they're only opened when absolutely necessary so that the contacts on the relay and the relays themselves don't burn up at all. The vitality principle also extends to the circuit design. Any wire that leaves the signal bungalow to go to the wayside, so be it a circuit that runs from the bungalow to a signal or a switch machine or anything like that is what we call dual break and that means that we send out our positive signal we get back our negative signal and we check both of them we don't just send out the positive and if it grounds out somewhere that's fine we have to receive that signal back that then says yes we did complete the circuit all the way back to the box and we received the expected voltage back if we lose either side of the circuit that's it we shut it down. There's also a reliability requirement for a lot of this equipment. This is a whole nother field of study in its own right, but talking about equipment and equipment failures, they have what is called the MTBF, mean time between failures. How long can these operate without failing? And the numbers are kind of ridiculous. Most train control equipment is held to like millions of hours of operation without failure continuous operation or continuous service. There have been some vital relays that have been in service for a hundred plus years and never been changed. And that's why the whole system is really built upon really robust circuit design where we check multiple different things. When you have a switch, you check that the switch had made its points close by detecting where the points are and you also check to make sure that you're not getting the reverse direction of the switch closed at the same time. You need to have both. You can't just have one. That is the design principle behind any signal design anything, is the vitality of the circuit so that if any one thing is not set up right, you do not get to clear the train to operate. And that's why it's really just a giant relay logic puzzle. So a relay, for those who aren't familiar, is a simple device one of these guys in here. The schematic for relays usually looks like this. When you apply a electrical signal to the relay, the relay picks, which means it goes up. And in logic form, it looks like this. You have a switch branch here. So when the relay picks, it points up and it says yes. And then when you take the signal away, the relay drops and it goes to the bottom contact or the back contact. These are the front contacts on the relay. These are the back contacts on the relay. And so for something like, okay, 
we need a green signal, you want to have the green signal relay picked and on the front contact, and you want to have the red and yellow aspect dropped. So saying no red, no yellow, but yes green. So let's go through an example of how complicated this gets for our level nine. Level nine, we like to call this relay logic madness. <laughs> so I started to put this together, a simple scenario, and I wanted to look at all of the different things that you would have to do and all of the different relays that would actually make up a train control system for this simple setup to give you guys an example. And I couldn't do everything because it just started getting into madness that would take hours to explain. I mean, this is stuff that you really have to spend a long, long time learning because of how complex and nuanced it gets. But we're going to try and wash over some of it and see how close we can get to give you this level understanding. So let's get a little briefing of what we're looking at here. So we have our train right here and we are approaching this chunk of track. So we have a track here, a switch, there's a siding track here, and then two more track circuits past the switch on the main track. So when I talk about the main track, we go this way. If I talk about the siding, we're going this way. We have two different signals and we have a switch machine in pink and we have our signal bungalow here all of this madness that we're about to talk about takes place inside the signal bungalow it's kind of amazing what we used to do with just relays so there's lots of names here there's different naming conventions based on which rarity you go to this is a kind of pretty standard one where we have westbound 100 based on the receiver stationing of the receiver of this track circuit then we have the one on switch track circuit one os we have westbound siding 200 and the westbound 200 for the normal main track and then the westbound 300 these are just easy numbers they're usually picked by stationing or mile post but anyways we then have the two west signal 2w and four west signal and this is a two head signal capable of providing more complex aspects to deal with the switch scenario that we have and a single aspect signal back here. There's lots of different things that we need to learn in order to provide any amount of signals to this train. We have westbound 100 track circuit. It's picked because there's no train on it. One on switch track circuit. Same thing. Okay, we go down and we realize that for each of these circuits, and there's only five of them, all of these relays are picked right now because there's no trains on them. Okay, what do we need to think about next? Well, there's a switch machine and there's lots of different things that we can control and receive from the switch machine based on what the switch is doing before we can do anything with the signals. We have the one NWR. So switch number one, normal switch relay. So if I wanna set the switch to this direction, the normal direction, the main track, I have to energize this relay. So when we energize that and it picks, it throws the switch to this direction. We also have the one switch reverse switch relay. And so that does the opposite. It lines the switch for the curve. We also have the one overload switch relay. So imagine that it's icy out and there's stuff binding the points and we try to throw the switch and the switch tries to throw for a while, but it generates a lot of current and the motor stalls out. And rather than burn up the motor and break things, we have an overload relay that says, hey, I'm giving too much current, I'm gonna stop trying to throw the switch. So if this drops, guess what? We're not running trains today because we know that our switch wasn't able to throw because something was prevented from throwing all the way. We also then have the indications from the switch, the one normal correspondence relay. So if this switch is lined this way and it's lined and we know it's lined this way, this relay will be picked. It'll say, yep, I know for sure that that switch is lined this way because my circuit's been completed. There's a special detection rod on the points of the switch that actually says whether or not the points have made contact with the stock rail. Same thing, reverse correspondence relay. Now, what about the signal itself? Well, we've got a bunch of stuff for both the 2W and the 4W signal to think about. 2W, we have the 2W signal, red home relay, 
So it's a home signal that we can control, at least in this example, and it's for the red aspect. Then we have the yellow home relay and the green home relay. Sometimes these will be uh, listed by root, and there'll be letters instead like A, B, C. So the A root or the primary root followed by secondary or third tertiary root, depending on what's going on. But a lot of times in color light applications, you'll see this. If we want to get a green signal, we need to get this relay to pick, and we need to make sure that these guys are both dropped. And then we do a really cool thing across the bulbs of the signals themselves, where we also check to make sure that the lights are working. We check the signal lights both with hot checking and cold checking, where you make sure that, yes, the light is producing heat and is continuous throughout it, and the other ones that aren't are not producing heat and are cold. And then those actually set off a couple different other relays that then satisfy the ultimate aspect relays. So 2W, green electric light, yellow electric light, red electric light. And so ultimately, if we satisfy all the things, we come down and we give a green, this relay picks, and we know, yes, we have a green signal, the train can go. But this isn't even the whole list. This is just some of the basic things to think about as far as the track circuits and the signal itself. And you also need to remember that it's up to the signal designer to determine what causes what. I have a purple train parked on this track circuit and I have this switch lined normal towards that train. Can I make the signal green? Well, it's up to the designer. Is there enough space here for the train to stop? Okay, and then you can probably have it green if there's enough space between the switch and this. If you're running really slow, you could have this signal at red instead of this one. But if it's really high speed territory, well, you probably have to have this one at red. And so there's no hard and fast, okay, well, it's this many circuits ahead, then that makes it a red signal, or, oh, there's a train here, so this is now red. That's the really simple look. The really complex look is everything gets factored in and everything has to be part of the engineering design, which is really what makes it a great logic puzzle. So if I have a train here, okay, I can make both these signals green, can I? Well, there's no other signal here, so this one has to be red. There's there's all sorts of different fun little scenarios to add, and they all add more logical things to think about. But let's try and get a good example of how the heck do we get a green signal there? What is everything we need to check? Well, let's look through a sample of logic that would show that. So as we would draw it out on paper, here we go. What do we need to get the green signal right up here that says, yep, choo-choo, you can go. How do we get that? Okay, so remember, up is a picked relay, and down is a dropped relay. So, we go, and we come in, and we start at the left, and we follow down our diagram. We want our green signal. Okay, westbound 100 track circuit. Well, it better be picked. There can't be a train in front of us. If there's a train in front of us, we're definitely not getting a green. Okay, and the next track circuit ahead of us, yeah, one on switch track. We're probably going to want that, too. And westbound 200, yeah. Oh, it's high speed, we're going to want that, and the 300, yeah, we're going to want all of this madness, because we don't have another signal up here, and we don't have stopping distance by this signal, this signal is just for these curves in this high speed territory that I'm proposing, so we need to make sure, no train, no train, no train, no train, okay, track circuits picked, 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 we're happy, okay, now what is this, westbound normal traffic correspondence, what does that mean, what's traffic mean? Traffic establishes the direction of travel down a piece of track. And I did name this track westbound, despite there only being one track for the example, but that's typically something in two main track situations. Gloss over that for now. Traffic means, okay, I need to have normal traffic. The direction that our trains are moving. We have this arrow. We need that to be locked this way. Because on the other side of this somewhere is another switch or another control point with another signal. And if it has traffic locked this way to let a train run this way, we don't want to end up with head-to-head -head trains stuck at both signals staring at each other or staring at each other at the same signal, etc. So we need to make sure that traffic is lined in our normal direction and locked for us. So we say westbound normal traffic correspondence. Okay, we need the traffic lined for us this way. So we say it is, it's picked, hooray. We also need to remember our safety design westbound reverse traffic correspondence, we need to make sure that that is dropped. We don't want reverse traffic. If the reverse traffic's there, 
or we have both for some reason, we have a problem and we can't run trains today. But thankfully we don't, so we continue on, and we drop down another line. Okay. Well, here's our one switch normal correspondence relay. Correspondence means that yes, the points are up against the stock rail. This is the switch is thrown for the normal direction. Okay, we confirm that, we pick the relay. Okay, well, we also wanna make sure it's not corresponding reverse. So we make sure that we're not also showing reverse and we're not, we drop that relay, that's all good. And then we have a bunch of different relays, which I am hand waving away as the 2W yellow. Everything that would say that this should be a yellow signal needs to be dropped or picked in the right positions so that we know that we don't have a yellow signal. Okay. Same thing for red. We need to make sure that that's good. So for everything for 2W yellow and 2W red, remember 2W is our first guy over here. Make sure that everything is set up that way so that we know that we can have green signal instead. We also need to check our next signal. Remember, we're running fast enough that we probably can't stop for this signal. So we check. Okay, well, we want to make sure that 4W is everything is green. Okay, and same thing. We want to make sure 4W is not saying yellow or red. Okay, and then what about locking? The interlocking we talked about that we're hand-waving away by saying one locks. That's not actually a relay. There's a bunch of different things that will lock this switch and lock this signal and lock this signal and prevent anything from changing even if dispatch wants it to happen or even if someone tries to request something else there's a lot of different stuff that we're going to talk about in interlocking 101 that prevents that from happening we want to make sure that all those locks are in place and only then do we get to the 2w green home relay and then we can pick the relay and we can get our green signal and our train can run only after we grab all of this junk. And this is just to say straight at a switch. So now look at a picture of any yard or terminal or terminus station or anything built in Britain, and you will understand why this is a whole field. Oh, I've realized I drew a cute little green light up here, but I was too zoomed down. Sorry about that. You didn't get to see the magic of the green light. Come on, hang on, I'll do it again. We pick the relay and then tink. We got our little green light and then our choo-choo can go. So this is what is the bread and butter of signals design. And oh my goodness, it's a lot of work to get here, but this is the stuff that really makes it interesting. It's not just, oh, okay, well, I know there's a train here, so this is a red light. It's so much more complicated than that. And it's so much more interesting than that. And I hope you guys are enjoying this video and finding it interesting as well. But that is our level nine. The madness of relay logic. And I think it's time for a recap. Uh, a little bit of a brain break. Talking through all those relays made my brain hurt. I'm sure it probably made your brain hurt too. <laughs> so let's take a little walk back over that last section that we talked about. So train signals developed and started to remove some of the human factor and making things more automatic. And the way that we did that at first was by having things like mechanical or electromagnetic trip stops that could stop the train and enforce what our signals want to do, re removing some of the human factor to them. But in order to remove more of the human factor, we had to know where the trains are. And to know where the trains are, we developed track circuits. Many track circuits use simple DC current running through the rails to form a complete circuit with a receiver relay on one end and a battery source on the other side with then the insulated joints that define the circuits. And as the train crosses into the circuit, it breaks the circuit and drops the relay out. And we know that the track is then occupied. A fun benefit of this is that if we break a rail, we can detect it and also stop our trains from encountering that problem. There were also track circuits using audio frequencies with basically speakers and microphones to accomplish the same thing, and some electrical engineering madness using alternating current frequencies to also do the same, particularly for electrified railroads with overhead catenary or a live third rail. And that was all our level six. In our level seven, we addressed the fact that there has to be a place for all of this equipment to live and it is inside the signal bungalows along our wayside that ties into our railroad. And everything that runs from the signals 
and switches and everything that's out on the wayside comes back to these distinct houses that are full of different signal equipment, relays, processors, track circuit modules, all of these fun things that help run our trains. There is a principle in signal design in level eight, talking about the vitality of the circuitry and the fail-safe nature. If we have a failure, we need to put things to stop so that we don't have trains running into trains. If there's an issue, something breaks in the rail, something breaks in the circuitry, we have a component failure, we need to tell the trains to stop rather than tell the trains to go. And we do this with a number of redundancies in both the circuits and the equipment and everything to ensure that when there is an equipment failure, no single failure causes a problem that could cause an accident. And perhaps one of the most important pieces of equipment within the bungalow and the vital logic is the vital relay. And as we explained for many, many minutes, the vital relays, there are many, back in the day at least, relays for everything and driven off of a large number of inputs. And you would best know the location and the relays very well if you want to know what they are. And there's too many acronyms. It's very painful. And we know that with the relay logic equations, we can read through and understand, okay, what do all the relays need to do to give us one scenario? And we looked at how to get this one green signal. And we didn't even talk about the different things that'll get us a red or a yellow, or even talk about the 4W signal or the siding. Uh, yeah, it gets complicated really, really quickly. Back in the day, you'd go into the signal bungalow and you would find it full and full of all these relays, relays upon relays, wires upon wires. And what do we have nowadays? Well, it's all handled by a computer. So you walk in, there's a handful of relays, but the prime principle for our level 10 is microprocessor-based control. So now we have vital microprocessors and they're usually redundant her main track. The processors live in the bungalows. The processors can talk to each other across locations and they could talk back to the office and to dispatch and provide for remote control that is entirely digital. Everything is a digital serial connection that says, okay, I send my communication and I know it's going to be vital as soon as it goes in and out of the bungalows. But everything that is bungalow to the wayside is still vital and has control. So if I have a broken track circuit and we're saying no trains on this track, this bungalow is in charge of that track, even if dispatch says, hey, I'd like a green signal, please, the bungalow says, nah, man, best I can do is red because the track circuit's out. And so these microprocessor-based systems help improve reliability and troubleshooting where it's all software, pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of pages of relay logic software like this these days that are now loaded onto these processors rather than piles and piles of relays. But piles and piles of paper is better than piles and piles of equipment that could possibly fail. And also the software allows for us to check even more stuff than this. We don't have to physically wire anything. We can check everything that we need to that could possibly cause a conflicting movement or a problem between any of these moves. For a simple diamond crossover or scissors crossover where you have four switches and one diamond, you will end up with something like a thousand pages of that relay logic for just one of those for every possible move. And there's only eight moves across that. You can only go straight, straight, either direction or go across either direction. <laughs> and so that's how much that adds up. But the important thing of this level 10 is that with the digital systems, we can also have the more advanced communication, which can help open the doors for things like positive train control, where our wayside can now talk to our back office. Additionally, there's also a really cool thing where you don't necessarily have to have the bungalows be connected by a separate wire. You can actually have the bungalows be connected by the rail. because so we got this rail. It's just a big chunk of metal thing. We can send signals down the rail and pick them up on the other side just like anything else and so there's actually a system called electrocode where you can have one processor in one house talk to the next processor down the road and so you can send messages down the railroad get them decoded at the next end so you don't necessarily even need to run the wiring and that's a quick look at a level 10 microprocessor based signal control and the last level that we're going to talk about today there's plenty more that we could talk about and we only really scratched the surface of train control itself but 
I hope you guys learned something today. I hope that the levels were interesting and I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I really enjoy doing this 101 series on the channel and I hope you guys are appreciating it as well. So let me know what you think down in the comments. If you liked the video, make sure you click the like button, click the subscribe button if you're new here, and you can also click the little bell if you want to know more. And as always, thank you so much to the ESND train crew who are the channel members who help support this channel monetarily. You can join and be a brakeman or conductor and you can get some extra benefits, some fun stuff for live streams, some extra content from me. Really, really helps me out, so I appreciate that and thank all of the ESND train crew for being here. Anyways, guys, thanks so much for watching. Please leave the comments down below. Thanks for watching.